Hello. Good to see you, Joshua. Hello. Hello, Glenn. Is it white Christmas time? Yeah, you got some snow over there? Yeah, it's snowy here as well. Oh, nice. it's so beautiful though, so white. Everything's so bright. Yeah. So, yeah. What's going on up there? How you doing, Josh? Good, I found out uh, my mom's dog likes to eat snowballs. Hello, Alex. Hello, Alex. Good to see you. Uh, fireworks coming up in a couple of days. Is that right? You got fireworks? No, out, out in the uh, town square. Downtown. Down on the river. Nice. With the bridge, Harbour Bridge. Oh, that's I awesome. I don't like them because they scare the animals. Yeah, but it's tradition, man. The animals can last. They'll be all right. <laughs> Pioneers with us, I think, as well. Yeah. I'm sorry I haven't been able to be with you for a few meetings. There's well, just glad I was uh, happy to get your message from Happy Merry Christmas and all that. Wondering how you're doing. Yeah, yeah, it's, I think it's wonderful this time of year, so quiet. I really had a really quiet period here today. Yeah. It's a good time to plan for your resolutions on the January the 1st. Exactly, yeah, those kind of things. Look at the year and contemplate and have some plans and it's a good time for that now. Sam, good to see you. I'm putting a J on my shoulder for Joss Winder. Hello, Joss Winder. My J for you. Here you go. All right. And Sam said he's booting up the computer, so he'll be right here. Yeah, my computer just booted up. And I'm going to try and put some audio because the puppies are uh, really loud here. Uh, I mean, mute. But I just wanted to welcome everybody. Uh, and I'll do a check in after you guys have an optional round of check ins, okay? Can I ask if you, if anybody, can anybody hear the noise in my room? I've got my fan going on full blast. When I mute, I'll, I'll mute my microphone. Tell me if you've noticed any difference. Mm -hmm. Noise is a little unclear, I think. No, your voice came through clear for me. Your voice is clear, but I can hear the fan for sure, but it's not like irritating. It's not, not for me at least. I don't know about it. Yeah, it's fine. It sounds like you have uh, gerbils hanging out by the mic. But I'm going to make puppy sounds so that way when Sam turns on his mic, it doesn't sound too bad. So. Okay, the puppies uh, have calmed down a little bit. Anyway, so I just wanted to again say uh, welcome again. Uh, my, well, I was going to wait till later, but um, let me do it right now. I know that I have been absent for several Saturdays and I feel really badly about that because uh, just things about the holiday season and puppies, uh, my daughter leaving for a week to go to California, I've made things uh, difficult on Saturdays. So I just wanted to acknowledge that, apologize to you guys for that and say that uh, that may again happen today, although I'm trying to avoid it. So uh, I have about three things stacked up on my list of things to talk about, but I'd really like to see where your minds are. And then uh, let's get into it. Over. Hey, Heiner. I was looking at a grid, interlocking grid of um, lines that intersect each other to form a pattern like an Islamic uh, design. 
and it made me realize that every intersection is a node in the human virtual network. If, if that person is connected to a smartphone, you get this uh, network effect. It can be put to good use because Collins mapping techniques would allow that that uh, grid to be alive. And each when you click on a click on a node, a list of members in that district would pop up, and the events in that area, like a, like a uh, it's an electronic technological telephone book with the extras with live video feeds <laughs> and Zoom sessions, etc. That's a cool observation, Alex. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, exciting ideas. Well, I, yeah, I don't have much of a check-in, but did you want to say something? Go, Joshua. Oh, I was just going to say, Glenn, uh, I was playing around um, with Carl Hemstrett and his brain software this year, and uh, it's pretty powerful connector type of software. It's a database that connects everything to everything, and every you can see your brain. So it's like uh, mind mapping on steroids. So if anyone ever wants to go steroid, if uh, Colin, you're listening to this at some point in the future, and you want to steroid it out and make all the connections connect to everything. It's a fun software. And uh, yeah, I uh, recommend if I don't have anything to connect everything, I just use my actual brain. But um, it, it was fun. I'm just saying if, if people are into that, it works. I mean, it's they built it and it's, it's expensive. It's really good software. With that, I'm complete. I'm uh, just here to have a good time and a good conversation and uh, maybe raise the roof a little bit. What, what? Actually, by the way, uh, uh, David Allen, he uses uh, the brain. So that's his favorite software. The guy who wrote uh, um, that uh, book, uh, Getting Things Done. And it's uh, developed that method. So uh, I've only tried it briefly, but yeah i mean it looks really exciting uh, i was gonna say I, I have some notes that i've written down so maybe that could be something to share at some point um otherwise i don't have much of a check and i just want to say merry christmas happy new year to everybody and i also kind of been not present too much lately but but now um uh, yeah it's good to be here i mean uh, well, some I'm kind of on and off. It's it's just kind of like that's the way it is for some reason. But um, but yeah, I've been definitely reflecting on uh, lots of the themes that we've gone through before as well. So very very interesting to just see see wherever it goes. But uh, I'll leave it at that for now. So. And Sam, yes, it's the brain so, com. Sorry, I can't. Go ahead. So I'm happy to see you all. I slept since Christmas and suddenly woke up and then I shouted to Josh, are you coming? And then I got out, out of my pillow to see you. It's good to see you. Maybe an update from my side. I was very exhausted the last six weeks because I really, I don't know why I do it. I really overturn myself. But in this period of lots of sleeping now, a few observations came up. Not only after the session yesterday, where I felt we should really in the barn raising mode, go to the developers of Zoom and ask them whenever someone is speaking, there is a clock time shown. So we see who learned to be sh short and terse and to the point and to really get a feeling of the time we 
we spend and use and misuse. And I think it would be very, very good, especially to do it in parliaments when I see how it is done in, in uh, the British Parliament or at Capitol Hill. I mean, it's a nightmare of not responding to the other person but doing their bit and, and this bullshitting. That is the first thought I have. And that was my dream I had with Tammy two and a half years ago. Can we do more than our initial test with time counting and time keeping in meetings, what we did with Tony Judge 30 years ago. So that is the first. The second, I wonder why are we only boys here? Where are the girls? What do we do wrong? Do we communicate not responding to the other person? Or don't we speak too much from our personal heart? Or are we too technical? You see, all this I'm, I'm wondering, and I think we should reflect on what is actually going on. Can we really build a group is not consisting only of males, but really come to communion? And third, I had some breakthrough at this climate uh, negotiations there in Madrid. I was presenting with my friend three times at the Resilience Lab of United Nations Commission. And, and there I have my coming out on end of December and it was discussed with the youth. So I will have a new identity end of December, which is called Heine2020.earth. So I will have to transform again and revisit what I did 20 years ago because I cannot leave it and say this was it for the end of my life. So these were the um, critical thinkings, thinkings and ponderings on my side. Otherwise, everything is fine in Berlin. It's just much too warm. No snow, no nothing. And I wonder about the Californians. Can't you send over some snow, Josh? Yeah, yeah. Sure, I got it for you. There you go. You can have it. I'm sending it through. Well, I think you I'll get go some from, uh, from Glenn also. Glenn's got some snow for you. Hmm. Closer to you. Lots of snow. Well, let me take this opportunity because one of the themes I wanted to talk about actually uh, spins right off this last theme that Heiner talked about. And I won't mention the other two for now, but the one I wanted to talk about is anger. So I've noticed that I'm actually a very angry person. And I know that there are at least two women in GCC that I've pissed off. And they no longer come to these particular Saturday morning uh, conversations. In my opinion, in my recollection, it was because I was leaning into something I did not understand. And I felt that there was a disappointment in them that I did not understand, that I should have understood. And that created a disengagement. So it could be me. I could be pissing off women. I don't know. I'm very open to understanding this because obviously I don't want to piss off all women. Um, but I do my fair share. So that's just uh, one area. And it, it includes this anger bit uh, about whether anger is ever appropriate or anger is ever positive in any sense. Uh, that's not really a check-in, that's really a, a, a riff on what Heiner was saying. Um, but my check-in is, this last week has been uh, really difficult, uh, but I'm trying to really engage with uh, barn raising today. Over. 
I don't know which two women Sam was uh, referring to. Just wonder, so, you're very faint for me. Can everybody else hear just wonder well? I can hear him. Is that any better? Sam? Better. Okay, I'll move the mic closer. There we I have go. my uh, speakers at max for some reason. I can barely hear still. You said that last week as well. I don't know if it's your PC or your settings or your ears it's a different or, your, or, your, or your earphones, but it doesn't matter. Um, yes, yes. Um, are we allowed to mention names, name names? You are, if you understand that this is being supported and is being publicly shared. Well, I think they know who they are. We all know who they are. And there are only two of them that we all pissed off in, in one particular setting, uh, two particular settings. And it was mainly one of them, uh, one of the settings was that we went off on a technical tangent. You, Sam, that's you, me, Joshua, Alex, and I suspect Glenn was there as well. Uh, we started off nice and steady and simple and all lovely dovey conversation and became quite passionate. Might have been artificial intelligence or something. Alex was, was very passionate about AI at the time. We went off on a tangent discussing what could and couldn't be done or etc. This particular lady objected and we went off on a tangent and left her sitting on the sofa and nobody asked her to join in and we were actually waiting for her to join in and the other one was um, a, a young lady from the uh, from the northern hemisphere very sharp young lady who's quite hot herself i mean hot tempered not to say that she's not hot and that particular one was to do with a young man who just joined in. This is going back about 18 months, maybe slightly less. Who had a thing about the word but and its usage as a co-joiner rather than as a contradictory term co-joiner. Anyway, he had a Barney with the aforementioned young lady who took an exception to him and the, the, the later younger lady, much younger lady, uh, took up the cudgel and she came roaring into one of our sessions that we just started and laid into him. And I was listening and then this went much further and it went up the, up the hill um, Tammy became involved and she listened into things and when my opinion was asked for I, I quite blatantly and honestly said that the young lady came in, she didn't pay much attention to who said what and that includes what Sam had to say and that we were very polite and we were waiting for the, for the older lady to join in the conversation. At no point did we, did we withhold from that. In fact, when we stopped our little terrain, we asked for her opinion or we asked for her to join in and she was very upset by that. And she had a little rant and off she went. So those two went off that way. Um, Tammy, I think, uh, is, is having her own little problems, one of which has come to a Very sad end, really, for her. And she's not going to be available for a month or so. As for having a timer, yes. Well, we've done the timer a bit, and some of our some of our conversations last longer. And some people have a natural aptitude for saying one thing, and having said that particular point. They repeat the point again 
and there's more than one of us who does that. Uh, initially, it, it used to, it's a time waster, so I used to make a point of pointing it out, and then I stopped. And then there we have the other one, which came about yesterday, which is not a bad thing, I suppose, is the over politeness of not interrupting somebody who starts speaking up, even a quarter or a half way through and say, well, I think that is not relevant or it may not be to the point and, and I think you're going up the wrong tree or whatever. And that is really upsetting to the person who gets, who gets cut off. And that, that, that is a no-no. We, we, we ought to allow cuttings, especially when it's a deep point that needs uh, to be kept on topic rather than digress. So it's not that we haven't tackled these topics. I don't know if Heine was there or not on, when we tackled them. But we certainly, I, I think Heine was there when we did the two minute timers and everybody had to have two minutes and no more. Less, yes, but no more. Uh, yesterday, Anna said that I could explain what I was explaining, which was a very deep topic, much, less words and advisedly I said no because it's a deep topic and if I explain with fewer words it may lose its meaning especially when when other people may be trying to hijack it to somewhere else another deviation so others at that point had sort of interjected and said that if that particular person <coughs> wants to believe what he's saying, it should be allowed. That's fine. But hijacking somebody else's uh, point and deviating with it, uh, that, you know, as, a, as an interjection or as an interruption, to stop that, that should be allowed as well. Um, why do all the normal people like us, why do we keep turning up? Because most of us have taken these rules, we've, we've, said, had, we've said our points about them and decided that, well, I've gone as far as I can trying to straighten that out. Occasionally, we have a foray into it and then leave it and drop it. Some of these old habits we have picked up are very, very difficult to allay. You know, when I interrupt, I am being personal here, it is a deliberate thing. When I take somebody off point, it is a deliberate thing. But if somebody were to stop me and say, look, I don't think it's off point, that would be acceptable and then it better not be off point. You better not be going somewhere up a dead alley. I really don't think we, we ought to be spending any more time than we already have on these items. We have some really juicy conversations of late. And we keep going back to the knickknack, back to the little, uh, thank you, uh, Glenn and Josh, of, well, we're not doing it right. We're not allowing people into our conversations. Um, and then when they turn up, they're not staying. Well, apart from chaining them to, to the GCC and the Zoom sessions, I don't know what else we can do. We can be overly polite, certainly. Then I wouldn't want to be staying here because we keep going off topic when we're overly polite. That's being childish. And I have, meant, I have said that many, many times. We, in many ways, we are still immature. But there is no point in berating that point anymore. Can we have an opening for questions where we for questions, that we interject questions to clarify 
that we really understand the person who's speaking. This is and one of the it, things I have encouraged very much, especially with um, Doug Breitbart, uh, mainly because he has long sessions of putting things together. He goes into a flow. He does not want to be interrupted. Now, unless I sit here ready with a, with a pen and paper and write down everything he says, especially towards the end of the end of the session, uh, his uh, his closing statements are quite long, and then he gets away with it and trying to remember what he said into the next session, or the next session is on some other topic, is difficult. So I have made a point of berating him. And he has now accepted that I am going to interrupt him and that his attachments, his associations on some of these topics are not conducive to carrying that conversation further because he tends to kill them. You know, um, Pavlov may have had a point that you can do association memory or conditional memory. Once that memory becomes conditioned, it's very difficult to break it. But I am always willing to give it a try to point out to the person that I think you have been conditioned that. And that is, is, a, is a, it's a block. It's a block for you. It's a block you want to pass to others. And that knowingly or unknowingly, it's usually unknowingly, when people do that unknowingly, is a no-no. It's like, it's like not correcting a child. And that is, then allows that person, be it politely or in any other fashion, to keep putting duff information out there. Now we're going to allow that. We had that particular point a long time ago, about a year ago, was that it should not be allowed. Duff information should be challenged. And a lot of the duff information, for, for example, the attention span of a goldfish has been challenged and it's been debunked. So we have now have fact checking societies everywhere who are there to debunk anything that we, they, that we think needs debunking. And the word mean was being debunked yesterday. And that was set in the 70s, before, the, before we had social media. So there are a lot of things that even science has put out there, which need debunking and challenging and being done passionately, if not forcefully at times. Otherwise, we keep going around in circles. We yes, we want down. to go around in circles. Yes, we what time. we do, we show either a mirror or the time. And when you see what has been happening here now, yeah. that I'm berating you, you have been talking nearly all the time of the session. We were trying to do a first intro and we are not aware of having the mirror in front of us to reflect how much time we are stealing from others. Yeah. And this monologues, and I'm now concretely not talking about girls who are not here, but talking yeah. about you, yeah. You should be aware and a little timer yeah. on your uh, plate here could yeah. really help you to come a little bit down in proportion. So yeah. please let us continue who is on deck and not monologue forever. I, I am now accusing you of the very same thing you are accusing me of because you took a, 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 a check-in and you said at least half a dozen topics in that, and you don't want them being answered on somebody else's check-in, which is mine. So I think it's I think it's we're unwise. We're all doing the same thing now. Alex wants to jump in. Yes, so well, it's, I think that. it's unwise. It's unwise to criticise yeah, people. Not, I'm still speaking for doing, for doing what you've been doing yourself, right? Exactly. So this is, what this is the exact same point I keep oh, making, is that what? if you do it, you why, do you, why yeah. do you then get upset when somebody else does it? But yet because we it's... mentioned many things that I think was very relevant here. Uh, we have been stuck and, uh, you know, um, if, if we're stuck in a pattern of, of speaking, then we're also 
going to be stuck in a pattern of thinking. So then we're not going to be able to think new. So if new thinking is what's needed, we have to have new uh, conversations. So we have to have freedom to experiment. And we can interrupt like this, good nature, and listening with interest. I will interrupt and suggest that we use a word other than accuse. Accuse is a, a bit violent. Um, I think the points that Heiner and Glenn and Jiswinder are making, in my opinion, I followed them all. They're all valid. There was an issue I think Heiner took about the length of Jiswinder's offering. And um, I think that uh, we have not, as far as I know, yet come to a global or even a barn raising agreement yet on that. There have been suggestions, but we've not had a, a formal agreement. So I see some people leaning one side or another, but uh, Josh and Alex have both had their hands up for a while. Actually, so after Josh and Alex have a chance to respond, I'd like to go back to just Winder and ask him to continue because I don't feel he was finished. And then let's see if we can hear from Chris. Yeah, Alex, you got your finger up, and Joshua seems to be okay to wait. But Josh, let's get let's get some of the women like Anna, Anna, and uh, Tammy to, to get together and do a women's a women's group uh, recorded session on the issue of the men's group technological babble. Over. Josh. Josh Kinder, do you want to finish the story? I didn't quite get that. Can you repeat that, please? I didn't hear that either, Josh. Yeah, I was saying, do you want to finish? I'm happy to wait. Well, I haven't had my check-in. My check-in would be this, that perhaps we could... Uh, uh, I, I realize Doug isn't here, which is a shame, because sometimes it does turn up. Um, I wanted to continue the conversation we were having yesterday. Josh, if you remember. I'm not sure whether we can continue with that, but it would have been good to have some continuity. And with that, I'm complete. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to say yesterday. Was there a talk on Friday? Because I was not there yesterday. Did you mean on Thursday? Yeah. Well, I just have three things. Uh, number one is... Sam's turned on the feature where you can raise your hand digitally without having to do this. It can go slow. So I just used that real quick. So I just want to put that back out to the group that if you want to, if I'm lowering my hand, raise my hand. I don't know if everyone sees that or the host sees that. Is that uh, something everyone sees, Sam? Or just the host? I don't know. But the other thing, the Second thing is to say hi to Chris. It was the end of the year, and uh, I wanted to say hello to you, Chris, and thank you for um, what you taught me this year of non-dominium, and thank you for bringing up the idea of a non-dominium. No one has a dominium over anyone. I've been working on that all year, and at the end of the year, I just wanted to say thank you for that, because it's quite the uh, wise understanding of how to work together in a group without having to form something. And to Heiner's point about time, I know we've practiced that here at Barn Raising and it went really well when we all were aware of time. But I want to bring up the third point is Robert's rules of order. Not the best in the world, but it's been on for over a century. And I've used it very well. Deeper, as well as someone that everything is Robert's rules of order. But uh, you can come to Wikipedia very well, and it's a good place to start. Uh, I'm order, and but starting with some structure that already works, that has been known to work for a long time, and it has timekeeping as well as note keeping, that might solve a lot of blocks. And with that, I'm complete, and thank you everyone for being here. I'm looking forward to a great conversation. Thanks, Josh. Chris, would you like to check in or offer anything on your mind? Yeah, hi, um, and thanks very much to, jo to Josh for sort of um, inviting me on because I've been very much um, 
immersed in my own world in this last few months, you know. Um, so it's good to see that the, um, you know, some stalwarts are still going. Um, I'm currently in Oslo, so plenty of snow here. Uh, if you're missing it, Heiner, this is where it is. <laughs> and uh, yeah, um, so I'm, I'm here until the new year, which is, my, my wife is Norwegian, so this is where I come. Um, but I've, I've had very, very interesting work I've been doing in uh, one of the uh, small channel islands uh, called Sark. Which I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it's worth Googling uh, Sark Electricity to see uh, what's, been going on, what's been going on there. Because Sark, Sark is um, still in, legally in medieval. Um, it, it hasn't gone beyond the feudal system. And, uh, and yet it still has electricity. Uh, it doesn't have cars, but it has electricity. And there's been something of a crisis there in relation to the provision of electricity, a commercial crisis. Um, and the guy who runs the system uh, decided he wanted to uh, switch it off because they've, they've brought in regulation to try and get him to bring his prices down. It's, it's a wonderful, it, it's basically a, the private um, transactional electricity system um, cut down to an island of 600 people, uh, which doesn't actually have modern legal systems. There is no company law on SARC. It is impossible to secure debt on SARC. Um, so how on earth can, can one actually conduct a buyout of this system? Uh, you know, just a buyout. And my background, for those who don't know me, is in legal, you know, law and finance. I was a director of a global energy exchange. I designed the UK natural gas market, for which, forgive me. Um, I have, I'm a senior research fellow at University College London at the Institute for Strategy, Resilience and Security. And it's with that resilience hat on that I was asked to sort of try and help um, resolve the irreconcilable uh, differences which exist on SARC. There's been a complete breakdown in trust between the island's government and the private sector provider. It's the most fascinating thing I think I've done in the last 10 years. It really is interesting. Um, and it's reached the stage where um, the, the crisis has sort of come back. Uh, I've been there five times and um, he's coming to a head in the next month or so. And the thing that intrigues me more than anything about it, and this is why I'm there, is that because of its legal situation, because conventional methods are not possible, one has to do something else. You know Sherlock Holmes's dictum, if you actually, you know, um, if, if, you tr if, if you try everything that's impossible, then what remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. Well, I'm actually dealing in the improbable. Um, and what I call um, energy fintech, uh, by which I do not mean blockchain and coins, I'm, I mean, I mean the, the protocols and the instruments that come after blockchain and coins, or possibly one might say reinventing the, the protocols and instruments that predate blockchain and coins and, and modern technology. So as the Financial Times said, um, and I, I know the people who said it, um, it's possible to go straight from the 16th century to the 21st century with none of the shit in between. So that is what I'm working on, on in microcosm. Happy to work with anybody. I don't know. You, I know Joshua and I know he's a, you know, his talents. I don't know what talents you guys have other than by reputation, one or two of you, but I'm really interested in sort of, you know, throwing out there uh, during the next few months, the, what in my view is is an opportunity to create um, a new operating system, I think, for, a, you know, shall we say, um, a non-toxic market in energy as a service rather than energy as a commodity. So that's my long spiel by way of introduction. SARC is where I'm busy working and I will happily forward, you know, any, some notes that I've done to anybody who's interested. <clears throat> Thanks, Chris. Anybody uh, felt like they haven't checked in yet? Going once, going twice. My first question to you, Chris, and I have a lot of things to go up on, but it's just spoke. Is the energy provider a resident of the island, or are they external to the island? Very good question. Um, his father uh, lived on the island for many years. Uh, the, the history is, in fact, 
if you go to the Sark Electricity site, you will see the history on one of the headings. Um, so his father was there, but his father died. And David, one of the three siblings, came and ran it for the next dozen years or so. Um, there's a huge saga behind this concerning um, the a pair of billionaire twins who have been trying to own or you know, take ownership of the island. Um, <laughs> honestly, they, 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 you could write a, you could write a book about it, write several books about it. Um, it was never privatised. It was always private in that um, some people were asked to tender to come and actually put a, an electricity service together, but they never had anything more than an understanding with the owners, if you like, the, the feudal owners of the island, that they should do so. So there, there is virtually no, <laughs> there is no legal certainty uh, of anybody there. Everything is being done by consent. Uh, in a sense. But what's happened is that the prices have gone up. It's now the most expensive electricity in the world, which is, is not an entirely bad thing in some ways. It's um, it's best part of a dollar a kilowatt hour. Thanks, Josh. Sorry, go on. Some, somebody's raised their hand. Sorry, I didn't catch your name. So Josh was just bringing a view of a website where he found sarkelectricity.com. Right, oh, excellent. Okay. Yeah, now can I mention something about Actually, the places it's not finished yet. The places in the world where electricity is most expensive are the places where people are going off grid more rapidly than anywhere else. Over. And that and that is such a good point because we're into a virtue into a vicious circle that the price goes up. People therefore find it worth their while to go off the grid. So the biggest remaining hotel is going to go off the grid, and that will just make it even more expensive. So, you know, that we have, we have seen just that sort of vicious circle. But of course, what that leads to is fragmentation. It's incredibly expensive and inefficient. What everybody actually needs to do is to essentially club together and do this together. But they've not been able to do this because of a fundamental breakdown in trust between the government, who are called chief please, and the private sector provider who basically it makes the um, Northern Ireland peace process look quite simple, actually. <clears throat> so I guess I'll follow up on my question. And that was, I was just wondering whether the electricity provider felt like part of the community there, or is there a sense of community there? And does the government view that entity as part of the community? And just one more thing, uh, uh, just to be, following up on Jess Winter's earlier point is, and I might be doing this to poke you a little bit, Chris, which I apologize. Sure. Can I say fuck legal? <laughs> I, don't, I don't give a shit what the law is. What is the right thing to do? And that's exactly my out, approach. That. Fuck that's the Sam, Sam, that's exactly my approach. Um, that, that, that is what I'm trying to do, is to put together a consensual agreement, just an agreement, to get it to, to actually get it done because the law is as an ex-regulator myself i observe a regulatory regime being put in use here which was designed for 60 million people and is being used on an island of 600 and their legal bill their legal bills are 700,000 pounds in the last two years for 400 people <laughs> it, so, it is you know, it's they've surreal. The island's got a government. That means they vote. That gets well, the government it deserves. <laughs> and, and, and honestly, that alone is worth a huge laugh because the the, 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 the form of democracy they've got there is that they put the mock into democracy, actually. It's, it's, it is really quite... It's become incredibly polarised. You've got... Two, two sort of contingents there, and nobody trusts each other. And um, you know, it is okay. Uh, not a not an island community; it's an asylum. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that, that's a good way of looking at it, actually. It's an insane um, <laughs> it, it's, it, it's, it's trust and sanity kind of the problem. Okay, so this is fascinating. I did, however, log. Uh, 
an intent earlier to see if Jess Winder wanted to finish uh, because I don't feel like he has. I think there's probably a way to tie these things together, but uh, Jess Winder, would you like to? Sorry. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, I mean, where, where, where I'm at is I, I believe that it, I, I've reached a point, not just with Sark, but also as a sort of, um, it works on any scale. I've reached the realization that there's, it doesn't matter how people, what differences people have, whether it's religious or ideological or whatever, um, it is always rational to actually um, cut, you know, to cooperate on costs, on energy costs. Um, you know, that's something I've come to the realization of. It is always, it doesn't matter how much you hate people, it's, it's like the lions and the gazelles sit down by the water hole, you know? It's a bit like that. So what I've found is a common ground among people who detest each other, that it makes sense to reduce Sark's insane yeah. energy costs. So that, 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 that is the sort of com common core, if you like. So I better complete at that point. Thanks, that was awesome. So well, let me just log again. Just Winder, would you like to complete your statement? And then let's see if we can put all this together. Um, I'm interested in this problem. I have very little knowledge of this, other than that Sark is in the Channel Islands and it's a tiny little island. It's a wonderful conundrum where, where there is an opportunity to put something together from the beginning and, and really uh, not, paying attention, not paying attention mm. to any of the other incumbent um, mm. um, governance systems or, or the electrical company, which uh, by the way, it, it's still serviceable, is it? Or does it need replacing the generator and the motor and all that? It, it is completely reliable. It's a bit like the Soviet system in gas. It's it will last for the next hundred years, but it's it, it's pretty um, inefficient. Yeah. Um, and what they need to do is make a, there are two things needed. They need to resolve the existing problem, and then they need to transition from a high cost, high carbon, uh, low cost, low carbon um, grid. And yeah. the the most the most interesting thing for me is that that actually is insanely good business bringing the cost down from 66p down to 15 or 20 is hugely profitable. So what we are able to do is apply, um, and I wax lyrical about this quickly, the James Watt business model. I think Joshua knows what, the, what James Watt's business model was, but not everybody does. Hmm. James Watt, the famous Scottish engineer, went to the Cornish tin mines with his new and much more efficient pump and he didn't sell his pump, which I call pumps as a commodity. He supplied the use of his pump in exchange for a third of the coal that the mines saved. And I call this pumping as a service. And of course, it, it aligned his incentives, incentives with those of the miners. And in my view, that form of like a swap of bringing the intellectual um, capacity, bringing technology, the use of technology in exchange for carbon fuel saved at the retail price. I regard this as being it'll be the, one of the biggest opportunities of the 21st century. <clears throat> uh, one last question, if I may. Mm -hmm. How much has the sea risen in the last 50 years? And what are the projections <laughs> for the sea level rise? I apologize for asking that, but I have to. Not a, these guys are 100 meters up, Jasminder. They're, so it's a bit like an aircraft carrier, really. Okay. They're okay. Right. Thank what's, you. The pop, what's the population of the island? Um, year round, uh, minimum's 400, a lot of tourists during the summer. Probably over 1,000 maximum. They could afford a window. They could afford several, but they have a problem that the islanders don't like the view being spoiled. So the maximum they will go for is a is 100 kilowatt. But they, they are looking at it, yes. So might I actually suggest, <coughs> Chris, sorry, uh, Josh. Um, 
ahead. Did you want to say something first? Please. Okay, so Chris, quick uh, question. The, you had confirmed that the costs of the electric system seem to be sufficient, you know, so it's not a matter of recovering costs. So this to me is almost classic capitalism. And I it don't is. mean that as a compliment, okay? <laughs> so I'm saying if the provider, especially a monopolistic one, wants mm -hmm. to price themselves so high that they appear greedy, they appear, you know, inconsiderate of the community, if they truly were considered part of the community, if they look like they're tending towards the, you know, 0.2% or whatever it is, you know, then the community has an opportunity to bring in either power walls or mills or geothermal or wind, you know. So at, at high prices, you know, other options become available and in fact attractive, as you said. So yeah. if this were a classic case of capitalism, um, why even interfere, you know? I think well, that this is actually not a classic case of capitalism because we're trying to do something quote unquote better than capitalism. It, and I'm not sure that everybody it, then understands that. It is complicated, Sam, but it, you make wise observations. Um, the, the big problem these guys have is it's a family, it's not a mega corporate, they are short of capital, so they are not even able, uh, because of these massive legal costs that have been forced upon them by this imposition of regulation, they're having to fund it out of cash flow. So one of the, re <laughs> one of the reasons why it's so high is the cost of paying Guernsey lawyers 500 pounds an hour, you know? Honestly, you could not make this up. In fact, the cost has been lower, um, but it, it comes down to what is essentially a commercial dispute. Um, yes, it is true that the islanders felt that they were being exploited, but against that, as you said earlier, Sam, there was a problem. It wasn't, sorry, it wasn't you, Sam. It was um, the observation that actually because the um, uh, consumption had come down, it was being spread, the costs were being spread among fewer and fewer people. So we got into that vicious circle. Alex. Um, fortunately, there are positive signs that one of the big owners who owns four out of the five hotels and actually shut them down, would you believe? This is how bad it's been. The owner of those hotels looks like he might be actually going to be opening them up again. I will send a link to, <laughs> to the saga or the solution I've got for the saga for your delectation, gentlemen and ladies. Um, and you may have a look at it because it's something I've been working on for a year, and uh, and I'm reaching the point where a little bit of a little bit of help would be useful. So there we go. <clears throat> I think if you can solve the problem, you might be able to transfer that solution to larger islands. <laughs> but why don't they just go and kick him off the island and take over the energy? <laughs> it's not so. It isn't so easy. It's, the, the grid is in fact an extremely good one. It's extremely resilient, extremely reliable. It's a, um, it's a very windy island, so there is wind, but one of the problems then is um, all the poles would have got, you know, were, used to be blown down. So they've buried the cable. You know, a lot of investment's gone into an extremely resilient, you know, stable grid um, in, in a way. And it's also, by the way, there is zero tax on SARC. So anybody who, for whom tax is an issue, <laughs> <laughs> that's where they go. Um, it's it's what you know is a very very interesting place from that point of view. So um, it's a completely there to do to come up with a you know an unconventional solution to this because nothing conventional can work. That's the attraction to me. And as you just said, um, if it works on Sark, if we can create something like I think of a partnership of partnerships or, or a co-op of co-ops is the way I'm looking at this. If we can get it to work on Sark Island, we can get it to work on tens of thousands of islands. Because that is the opportunity here. You know? Every island... Sorry, yeah, go on. Thank you, that is such a great point. Good to see you, Stacey. Yeah, yeah, that, that, is, that is what makes this so inspiring because if we see one of these islands they're going to start a new system one way or another. If they make it work, then they become an example. 
that can be replicated in other parts of the world. So that yeah. the, the real opportunity of such an island and of any island is a very big one. Yeah. And uh, I think that's also interesting to mention, <clears throat> saying this briefly, Sam, uh, even about an island like Great Britain. Like, okay, something is happening there. What if, let's say, they saw this, for whatever reasons of what's happened, as an opportunity to, to really create a new kind of a civilization? If one could make it work, then maybe that's what's needed. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to interrupt a little bit. And Glenn, I, I see the idealism there. And yet, Chris introduced this, this situation as complex and unique. Mm. So my question is, it's actually not a question. Let me start with a statement. <clears throat> I'm less interested in the solution than in how they get to the solution. In other mm. words, I, I feel as you describe this situation, similarly to the way Neil Davidson describes his situation working with uh, uh, his particular uh, tribes and islands, and that is, how accepting is that community of a solution which may come externally? <laughs> and how much of a party to that solution is the mm -hmm. community itself mm -hmm. with all of its ins and outs and irregularities and et cetera? So I'm more interested in how we bring about a way of thinking and a way of collaborating rather than the actual solution itself. Because you take a look at another island, you know, look at Easter Island, you know, they failed. Uh, they probably had externalities or, you know, not. Uh, and then you take a look at Great Britain, it's not exactly an island in the sense that Sark is an island. Uh, so there's, there's, a, there's a willingness to try and apply solutions and thinking, mm. I think, too simplistically. Mm. And that's why I think the acceptance of the, the path towards solution, to me, is more interesting. It's, that is, again, Sam, so well put. It's this process of what I call resolution and transition to the solution, which is, you could apply it to any forms of disputes almost anywhere. This is just a variation on the theme. This is a dispute about energy. It could equally well be about land. It could equally well be about almost anything. And it's also Purity. about the process. It's the process of getting to somewhere from here. <laughs> How do we get there from here? And um, that, that is such, such, a, such a wise observation, Sam, I must say. Um, and, and that is what intrigues me, again, wearing my ISRS hat. That's why I'm there as a third party, but not... This is such a good point. You cannot come in from outside and say here I am, that here's the solution. God knows that's the worst possible thing you can do. It's a matter of talking to people, listening to them, making possible suggestions so that they then think that they, that they actually take up the suggestions themselves. You know? Yeah. You know, this, the people living on the island have the best um, view of the issues. Yes, and the most the most broad understanding usually, unless they're yep. all uh, unless they're all um, what do you call it? But the thing is, if you can get them to agree to come to a Zoom session of their own, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. get them get some of them a group of them involved in a Zoom session and let them discuss it face to face mm -hmm. live and record the session, so mm -hmm. the whole island can watch it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that'll pretty quickly resolve some disputes or, or so, create some new ones. <laughs> There is a flow here, but I also want to welcome Stacy. She's Stacy's, uh, what, joined uh, 58 minutes into this thing. Uh, Stacy, we've been going hot and heavy around a topic uh, that Chris brought up. And before that, Jaswinder had actually uh, introduced a number of topics, and so did Heiner, and actually so did I. But uh, we're now on this issue of Sark Island and how they actually fix their electrical, quote unquote, problem. But uh, that's a very bad mischaracterization of it. Uh, so anyway, that's a one-liner to this, and uh, I invite you to check in, and then we'll see where this conversation could go.
Yeah, I'm good. I'm sorry I'm late, but I'm enjoying the conversation. I'm picking Actually, up. Actually, you're more welcome than you realized. Well, this, I hear the whole collaboration kind of thing going on, so I'm really glad I came. Just for your uh, reference, Heiner asked when he first got here, where are the women? And that launched us into about 10 or 15 minutes worth of uh, conversation. Anyway, welcome. Hopefully you'll be able to um, jump in as you need to, to clarify. So anyway, Chris, uh, <clears throat> I think that this whole issue uh, was characterized when I took, oh, geez, was it actually a management training class? I hate to say that, but someone once told the story of a big uh, international negotiation where the Koreans were involved, and I have to look up the specifics, and where the American team checked into a hotel. The Korean team actually, like, bought a house or something like that you know <laughs> so they have very different time scales <clears throat> of what was required and how much time it would take to actually understand the problem and actually come to a agreement about things uh it was a very stark difference in underlying assumptions going into a negotiation and just that story of you know do you actually move in or do you actually just plan to stay for a couple of days mm. was a very stark difference in how these teams approached it. Uh, nevertheless, uh, <clears throat> I actually don't know the end of that story. All I knew is just by that, it was clear the Koreans are willing to outpatient mm. the Americans. Uh, anyway, small aside, uh, Josh, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was gonna say that your story, Chris, is very personal to me because I'm homesteading up in the mountains it's been about uh, 14 years from the time that we bought the property till now. And about four years ago, we had a long conversation about when to open up our family retreat center. And mm -hmm. one of the conversations was in order to make this work, we need to build stronger infrastructure. So we have mm -hmm. three people and we can't even all decide together. It's my mom, her husband and myself. <laughs> and it's been 14 years trying to figure this out, how to get electricity up here to different sides of the property, what type of electrical system to build, what happens five years later when the batteries completely die, mm -hmm. what happens when the uh, solar panels get blown off the roof or come unhinged, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very personal to me to try to figure out how do we build a retreat center for 10 to 20 people to be able to come visit in the middle of 5,000 foot mountain that has a uh, 9,000 feet above us up a dirt road that's 10 miles that the last time we asked a truck to come up here, the guy delivered a load of rocks and said, I will never come up again. If I had known that my truck would get scraped up on all the trees coming up the dirt road, I would not have taken this job. So just to get someone to come up here is really difficult. <laughs> and uh, during you know the seasons like now with the winter, it's impossible. And even if you have a four wheel drive vehicle without chains on your vehicle. So the challenge of building a community with infrastructure is a very personal one to me. And it, it how you get those things settled and figured out is it's an engineering problem. I really think that people have to look at things from an engineering standpoint and a time frame. I was listening to a really wonderful conversation I want to share with everyone from a gentleman named Sebastian Thurn, who was one of the lead engineers for the development of self-driving cars for the Google Challenge uh, in 2007. And his team ended up winning the Google Challenge. But one of the things that he said I want to share with everyone is the reason why his team won that and why he's been so successful ever since is because he looks at everyone on the team in a different way, which is he doesn't look at their actions, he looks at the intention. And he actually finished his project a month earlier than all the other teams and spent the last month debugging the three little things that would have caused them to fail. So getting things done on time or before time and having extra time what you said, Sam, about the Koreans and people looking at the time scale differently, I think that's the key to success. And one of the things we did up here was we looked at the time frame and stretched it out an extra two years to dig a really deep trench 
that went from our well up to the top of the mountain so that we can consistently pump water to the very top. Because before we had that, we couldn't build very fast. But once we dug an 18 inch trench from the wellhead all the way to the top of the mountain, we could easily pump water that could gravity feed to the rest of the property. And that's made all the difference in the last three years. So stopping doing things right, taking the time, I think is the key to any success, whether it be us here at the GCC communicating, stopping for a second and saying, hey, if you wanna raise your hand, are you gonna do it like this? Are you going to click on the three buttons on the top and click on raise hand? And if you do raise the hand, does everyone see it? Like right now I'm doing it. Does everybody see that my hand's raised? Can you raise mm -hmm. your hand if you see my hand raised? Because when finger is raised. Okay. So if we're all using the digital platform, that stops this kind of stuff and the audio. And then what, what does the host responsibility have? Meaning you're the host today, Sam. So what is your responsibility? And does everyone agree that that responsibility is going to be given to you? And how do you relinquish that responsibility to somebody else? So if we stopped and just did that for a moment, and then the question is, do we agree that that's how Sunday's session is going to run, Friday's session, Thursday's session, or is it just Sam's Saturday barn raising? And once that is clear, how do we communicate to the new people that come on here that don't have the rules? And that's what we're doing, at least up here in our little mountain retreat, is we're building a frequently asked questions area because we're all sick of saying the same answers to all the people that say, when are you guys going to be open? <laughs> so I have to build a website with the frequently asked questions. And then I've got to sit down with my mom and my stepdad and ask them what questions are they getting? And then we're going to have a big argument about their question is a little different than the question I'm getting, yada, yada, yada. But by stopping and having that stuff done and that infrastructure is laid of communication, then you can move forward. And I thought it was brilliant what Sebastian Thurn said is he's never met someone who had bad intentions. And to me, that is a brilliant way to look at life is even the most evil people believe they're doing good. Even if they're a narcissist or some sort of psycho, you know, person, even a Donald Trump believes in his own mind, in his reality, that he's doing good. He's a good person. And he stopped all the terribleness of America when our president of the United States called him out some five, six years ago and, and belittled him in front of all of the powers that be at the, uh, what do they call it, the press conference meeting in Washington, the President Barack Obama really belittled Donald Trump. And I think that's what motivated him to take his job. So if he hadn't done that that day, maybe we would have a better country here in America. <laughs> I but think you're spot on, Joshua. <laughs> It, it, wow. It's really true, though, that people that are narcissists and horrible people actually think they're doing good. So if you can ask them what their intention is mm. and hold them to that good, and I learned that from Sam over the last two years, that's one of his beliefs, is if people hold other people to their intention, not their action, we can get something accomplished. And I just wanted to share that with the group because that was, I thought, the most wise words I've heard all year except for Chris's non-dominium, which I think is a very wise way to start a club because power over is not going to work in the new, the feudal system, the power over. We all meet every week and say, we don't want power over each other. And with that, I'm complete. I'll be succinct, Heiner, and end it right there. I'm complete. Then we have to share our intentions, don't we? I mean... So is the underlying question here how to create a good community? So then I'm going to ask, what are the success stories? Uh, which ones get it right? What did they do? Is there a science for um, measuring this? Is, is there a registry? <coughs> And what are they doing? What are the communities that thrive, that grow, that learn, that become great friends, that go on a journey together, that make great things together? Uh, what, where are they and what are their characteristics? That, that's what I would want to know. 
relating to this. So if you were designing a community and you had all the powers of, of a supreme designer, creator, would you be able to do it any better than nature's already done? Maybe I didn't have to. I mean, if, if somebody's already found a way that really works, then we can just do that because it's already been made. So it's science, it's evolution. Just, but um, yeah, so then we wouldn't have to design it from top down. We can simply see empirically what are the communities that really make it work. What are they doing? We could actually perhaps see their example, like on video as a documentary even. And then well, I think we, we're, we're talking about, I mean, that, that is obviously the possibility that, uh, you know, uh, would be very interesting because that would be something to build on. Yeah. So let me just uh, do for the last time, um, <clears throat> invite Jess Winder to finish his opening statement uh, and give you that option. Because I'm sure there's a way to connect all of these threads of conversation. We've had all of these conversations before. We have come to conclusions, very nice conclusions. Um, we're all fallible. And in that, forgetting things is a prerequisite of moving forward. If we don't forget things, then we're holding a grudge. And as for one-upmanship, it really does come down to that. In, in every conversation, whether we do it politely or whether we do it passionately or whether we argue about it, somebody has to have take responsibility for raising that, for raising that and holding the conversation together. Not everybody can do that. The thing that the thing that's come clear to me is that the moderators who were already in place here, regardless of their persona, they're always given way to, but if you put a new moderator in, and that one may not be given way to, and if there are grudges there already, then those will be continue, one complete. So, uh, I resemble that remark, I guess. Um, but I think this memory issue is a touching one. You have to remember certain things and forget other things, right? So somebody who, who said uh, something like, write certain things in granite, but write other things in sand. Write your sorrows in sand, write your happinesses in the granite or something like that. Anyway, uh, it's, a, it's an oblique way to make a point, which is we do suffer from not having uh, the shared perception of the value of group memory, but we also suffer from the phenomenon of all of us having a very long-term memory of chips on our shoulders. And that's what creates these recurring conversations. And yet, without, in a sense, resolving them, those chips continue to sit on our shoulders. And that, I think, is one of the fundamental questions here. Uh, I do feel that there's a way to tie all these threads together, but uh, I'll give other people a chance to weigh in. Or Stacy to make a statement. Well, one thing I was going to say is when it was mentioned about community, the one community that I thought of was really the recovery community. because, And I think there's something in those 12 steps that really touch on people feeling valued, um, they touch on amends. You know, there's a lot of things in there that I think connect people and bind people. There was a, there used to be a meme going around and I just tried to look it up and I don't even know if it was real or not, but they talked about a village where when somebody does something wrong, they bring that person and they all tell each other what, they all tell that person that was wrong what they've done right. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? 
because I mean, I think that's brilliant. You know, I think about bullies all the time and when children are growing up, those bullies, those are the ones we push further away. So again, I always tend to think it starts with the individual. And if we looked at the, I think uh, you, you used the phrase uh, uh, mental fitness. If we looked at that and helped to nurture that, it would be a foundation. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Mental and emotional fitness, I would add. Yes. Yeah, I was really inspired by that, actually, when you share that mental and emotional fitness. How can we have that? It's uh, such, a, such an interesting question. Very so we all possible. assume we have it. That's the fundamental difference. We assume we all have it. And yet, we, when we consider physical fitness, it's much easier to recognize when we don't. But it's very difficult for us, especially for each other, to recognize that we're not quite in any sense cognizant of whether we're physically or emotionally fit. And we don't even understand that notion yet. Over. Yeah, how can we get fit? Because uh, it's such a big issue because if humanity collectively, if our collective mind goes in a certain direction, I mean, that's kind of what it all depends on in a sense, isn't it? I just wanted to stress that point. Okay, Jeswinder and Alex both have their hands up. Well, jumping from small collective to the entire humanity, um, then it's a huge leap. Even, even from going from here to a, a small island that Chris is talking about, there, there's an immense variation, even, even if you took that island versus the UK. If we get a model together here and we can make it work, and there are some prerequisites, then you could possibly put it up and say that could be a world model. But you have to make it work first. If we don't, then we cannot hold it up as an example and we, and we cannot go straight to the world model. I'm complete. Okay, there's, there's something I can do to fit in with the conversation and the group rules that for a few hours wouldn't disturb me, I can go with the flow and change my behavior so that it fits with the group's uh, wishes and the, their motives for being in the group. And the, <clears throat> so that I can do that for a few hours, so something that I wouldn't want to do for the rest of my life. But I can go back to being me after the show. But for that period of time, I can adapt to the rules of the group and behave in a way that is acceptable to the other members of the group. I don't have to interrupt if other people are not liking that or wish me to be raising the hand instead and waiting for an opportunity to have my say rather than interrupting. Oh, well. So let me make an attempt. <clears throat> One of the topics that I came in when Heiner introduced uh, this notion of monologues and women is this notion of anger. I was asking whether or not anger ever had an appropriate role or whether it could actually be in a positive way. Because I think that it's an interesting question. If you replace the word anger with irritation or even frustration or trigger, you could ask you know, the same question and you might get different answers. But I'll just put it right up there, you know, as anger is one of the big ways that it shows up. Is it ever positive? Is it ever constructive? Because I think there's anger at <clears throat> 
and disengagement. It drives people to disengage. And whether or not one is actually willing to listen, especially to people who are not quite so familiar. I could say more, but I'll leave it at that. What if we're angry about a real injustice? Like I was angry here the other day because I see pensioners are sleeping outside, I read, uh, in the cold, certain countries. And there's lots of houses that are warm. I mean, how stupid can it get? It's unbelievably stupid. And you just get pissed off that humanity can't do any better. Uh, we have to be able to include everyone and have minimum standards because if some people are just thrown away like trash, that breaks the self-esteem of everyone else that we're living with it. it it's, it's an insult to our dignity. It's an insult to our intelligence. You get angry at it. You get angry at all the stupid arguments. Like, I can't even follow the impeachment process because this is literally a room full of insane people who are completely uh, in, in a trance. Okay, maybe it's a period one has to go through. But, but the thing is that you get angry that it's this madness and it's all this trivia when it's real people who are having real issues that can easily be solved. Uh, there's technologies that can solve all of this. There's tools that have been developed. There's permaculture systems that have been developed and tested and have succeeded. And we should look at those examples. And I mean, we can fix all of this. We can do it a million times better. And that makes me pissed off. Like, we should do better with everything as possible now. That's an example of something I'm angry about. Okay, I feel very, very um, much energy in what we are discussing here, because it's not only our intentionality, it's also our reality. Is my reality focused on the me or the you and the they and the others? And being in this multi-track diplomacy and peacemaking and dialogue processes, where different communities try to find peace, I, I really felt I have to say something on, on what I meant with um, the awareness of time. I will share now one slide and tell me if you uh, see it. It is in dialogues that we have systemic laws, requisite variety, requisite parsimony, saliency, meaning, distinction making. It is very important that we reflect not what someone wants or intends, but what his realities, in which scales, in which sectors, in front of which time frames, what we are talking here about. All these methods have been developed in the 60s by the Club of Rome, and I'm pushing it in here and there. And this um, uh, uh, parsimony and this saliency and this variety are so important. And that's why I sometimes uh, cannot cool down and say, please talk less. It is much better if you say only one word at the right time, then talk a long time. That's why I'll shut up now. And there is something that needs to be understood by the person experiencing the anger. If they have experience with meditation, they can usually intercept the emotional energy when it happens by using breathing techniques and other methods, uh, certain words that have been remembered. And then you can channel that anger, that energy to a positive, to something positive and make use of it. 
otherwise it's just a wasted emotion and energy it can turn to negative things over okay. I hear when most of you talk about anger you're looking at it as a motivator to do you know to do right for the things that are wrong but the part that gets overlooked is from the other direction anger is there to cover and you can't just get rid of it by thinking it away or meditating it away because that that's a sign to tell you where your pain is that's part of the path to mental wellness and health so when that anger occurs yes there's that part that motivates you to do something good but enough time isn't spent figuring out where that anger is connected to our own pain does that make sense sam i see you Yeah, I like that that core meaning that you just gave. I was just going to bring up a point as far as uh, meditating, thinking, and health, and mental health versus physical health. And the food we put in our body gives us nutrition and physical health. So we are what we eat, but we're also what we ingest with our mental diet. So what, what are we actually listening to? I mean, no offense to you, Glenn, but I live in America. I don't follow the impeachment because to me, that is a disgusting sandwich that I don't want to eat. It'll literally rot my brain and hurt me. And it is poisonous to my mental health. So I, I don't follow the impeachment trial here in America. For me, me personally, it's a food that I want. My men. Yeah, I'm just saying being aware of what you put into your brain as far as thinking and learning is really, really important. And how we share good nutrition mentally with each other is the point that I just wanted to make real quick. Thank you. I love that point, Josh. And there are still people to whom that impeachment needs to inform. If we all turn our attention away from the impeachment, then McConnell wins. He gets to do whatever he wants. He gets to run the trial with a complete agreement of the Trump team. To me, there's only, um, only transparency and a form of anger from the rest of the citizenry can hold McConnell and the Republicans accountable. And without that anger, without that willingness to rise up and really just call the idiots the idiots that they are, Actually, that's a little bit too strong. In someone else's terms, yes, the Republicans actually think they are doing good. But this is the transparency that needs to come through this entire system that will then let people make up their own minds. And yes, if we allow the Republicans to stay in power after all of this transparency and all of this coverage, then we deserve what we get. But if we actually allow that to take action, for each of us to take action, Whatever that means to us, whether it's voting, whether it's, you know, marching, whether it's writing letters, writing emails, you know, going out and polling, you know, starting new uh, campaigns, you know, supporting other candidates, whatever that means. If we don't allow some of that to enter our awareness so that we can take action, then we do deserve what we get. Over. So, so I follow the because this is something I talk about with people on both sides of the aisle. If I'm watching it. Stacy, your mic is uh, breaking up. Can everybody else hear, Stacy? No, it was unclear. Right, yeah, your mic is breaking up. Try again, Stacy. 
they were breaking up. Turn your video off for a minute and talk. Can you hear me now? Now I can hear you. Um, what I was going to say is, here, we have no, you can't hear me. It's low, but low, yeah, but I can hear. Well, I have my speakers on max and I cannot hear Stacy. Then I'll forget it. I came through for a second there. Something happened. I think you probably have a bad cable. Can you hear me now? No? Yes or no? It's low. We can hear you, but it's very low. Well, what I can, I'll just talk loud. <laughs> That's, that's better. Perfect. No, that's what? much better. Something worked when you did that. that was yeah. Okay. Now you are live. What I was going to say is it's up to us to regulate ourselves as to the anger. So usually under most circumstances, I can, for example, watch the impeachment process and not really get too angry. I get more like, do they really expect us to believe what they're saying? But I don't find myself angry. There are times when I get into groups and like some people, they will just really, I mean, it's like the game is how can we upset Stacy? Then I have to leave because then it just gets too much. But again, we have to regulate that for ourselves. Can I ask a question to, uh, I'm just, from my perspective, I see it as a show to distract you while the politicians take all the money and do all the evil things that they're doing. So I just don't understand why anyone's even paying any attention because if you actually follow the actual game, there's no way in hell 20 Republicans are gonna switch sides from the Republican and impeach this person. That ain't gonna happen. So it's all just a show to distract you and the media and the American people so that they don't fix the problems that got Donald Trump elected in the first place. And if you don't fix those problems, then they can utilize that for their benefit for the next Republican takeover. It's just such a simple game. I, I, am I the only one that sees this? I'm just curious. But Joshua, there's also the values. I mean, if we don't agree on what it should be, you know, I hear that things have always been horrible. I get that. But when do we start moving forward you know, every time I'm talking to, let's say, a Trump supporter, they'll say, well, what about when the Democrats did this? And I'll be like, you are right. That was wrong. When do we finally agree that, okay, what do we want? Do we want to stand by our word? Do we want to expect other people to stand by their word? And when do we start that? Jazz? Uh, this is it can be viewed as a very simplistic thing. One, America, since about the 1920s, has become the number one superpower. Number two, its film industry is the greatest, even today, in quantity and in quality. Third, America was the guardian of morality up until recent times. And we're looking at about the 1980s, mid 80s or thereabouts, and then it started changing. So oil, we keep forgetting that it's not money that drives the economy. The world economy is driven by oil, especially black, thick, heavy, sweet oil, which there ain't a lot of and uh, uh, Iraq has been subdued for that very reason. Secondly, the Middle East or, the, or, or the, the Arabian countries, the Muslim countries were making their own trading block and they were going to walk away from the petrodollar. Are we all clear that the dollar is linked to the oil? Are we all, do we all know that, that without the dollar, the oil, people can't buy oil, or they can, but as soon as they run out of dollars, or they're trading for dollars, they can't buy oil. No oil, no economy. In the mid-90s, India was at that stage. It could not buy oil. 
it had run out of dollars. So India had to start trading externally. I'll give way to you in a little while, Alex. So, along comes a man moving about 40 years, approximately 35, 40 years forward from the mid 80s, where Reagan really turned the pressure on of moving money from the middle and the lower echelons right up to the higher echelons. There is a graph about this somewhere floating around on the net and shows you how all that happened and says, I'm going to make America again great again. This hits the baby boomers, the post-war baby boomers, people of my age, where they want to be hit. We want to be great again, to be able to say what we want, when we want to say it, to have people working under us, even though we were, didn't know anything, we were probably ill educated, educated at all, but we were in charge and we were the world rulers. That is a utopia that never existed except what the government told them exists and we believed it. To a certain extent, I believed it as a Westerner. How, that, how are we going to put that back? Is that going to exist ever again? And isn't that maybe classic patriotism? It's sheer bigotry, but they don't know it. And we were saying at that time and before that last 500 years, the white man has said, we're putting the world to rights. We're building the world. And it's going to be utopia. And at the same time, they were robbing it, left, right, and center. It's not something that these people, and I'm not chastising them, they're very nice people. They're well-meaning people. They're well-intentioned people. But their intention is totally misguided. There is no way of shifting them. You could talk to them for years and years, and I did. Make a friend, become a, a personal guide, if you like, and try and change the vocabulary. No, it's not quite like that. It might have been, but things have changed. No, no, I want that. I want, no, I want to be like that again. It's a no-no. It's really just having to wait for them to die out. Not a nice thing to say, but death has its uses. I'm complete. Well, they'll die sooner or later, but isn't it possible for us to evolve all through our lives? I mean, what would prevent us from, from doing that if we, if we really wanted to? I'm doing it. I'm, at, I'm doing it. I'm going out and planting trees in the garden and raising saplings. Part of that is because some corporations in the world are changing. They're changing the way they interact with the community and their investors. I've noticed that with Amazon and, and Apple, some of the big players are doing it too and investing in community groups small community groups where they get their products advertised in our faces because that's basically what they're all usually trying to do but the thing is groups small groups that band together and affect change on the local scene is what grows and grows and grows provided the people in the bottom of the pyramid the the bottom up movement are, move, are weavers, movement weavers. So they interact with their friends and they get them all to come on board. They talk about links, they talk about web pages and solutions. This is where it's happening. And the old paradigm, the politics and all that shit is what drives the women away from the group. Technological speak and politics. And just window, I don't mean to criticize the fact that you bring up these royals tycoons all the time because they're part of the picture that things are changing now they're going out of the picture now oil is finished even coal is finished because the solar is so cheap now 
Solar panels are cheaper than oil and coal. Over. And the sun is burning over time, of course. I don't know what drives other women away, but one thing that drives me as a person, I don't know if it's a male-female thing, is this notion of this is the way things have always been done, so this is the way we're going to do it. Or it's already been tried. Um, for me, that, that's what drives me away from a place when it's like there's no, the emphasis is more on criticizing than on trying new things. Even, you know, just like automatically determining something won't work. When you don't know, because we've never been in this moment here, these circumstances have never been exactly the same. Exactly the point. Thank you. Yes. That's the point, isn't it? Like, like, like we're caught in all these habits. Isn't that what Jess Winders talked about too? That it's all of these habits. Just like uh, Chris shared uh, with this village, it was the problems of trust. It was the um, fractions. Uh, habits of movement, habits of thinking, habits of relating, but but like, what if we sort of self imprison in that by sort of talking about it as if it's inescapable? One, just one question to Stacy. What's our leveraging power? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. How do we leverage this change? We all want it. We have the intention, and there are blockages. We have Mr. Boris in the UK, we have the French Prime Minister, we have the Indian Prime Minister, the uh, um, American President. They're all extremely patriotic, and they all want their country to be great. And they're all driving their particular countries in the wrong direction and the world economy in the wrong direction. We have labor. We are the labor. We can withdraw our services, our labor, and die very quickly because we don't have the money to last more than a month or two or three. Um, so what is our leverage to change the policy running currently, Stacy? Well, what you said before about first doing it in a small group. There are yeah. people, we don't recognize what we do. There are people here who, for example, have told me more than one time that I'm great at something. Yet, when they're working on a specific project that might need that skill, I'm not invited into that room. I've asked a few times to be part of certain discussions, and I've been put off and put off, put off, because there's no PhD after my name. So it's those kind of things. If we don't recognize what we're doing ourselves right here, um, I've been in another situation, not necessarily in, in GCC, but in a related area where there's been a lot of talk about a particular leader who is very um, misogynist. And although he's been called on by women, not one man has risen up to speak up. And so instead, the women wind up either leaving or getting kicked out. So <laughs> again, if we can't do it in the, in the little groups where we have these personal connections, you know, why go any further? Right. So wherever you are, wherever you go, wherever I go, we have to have some leverage. I've been into meetings where I, I'm not asked to speak, but I will speak. I've been shouted down. Get it out there kind of thing. And when the internet came along, it's exactly what I'm doing now. Having said what I said previously, that there is a large number of people, and it was believed up until the 12th of December in this country, the labor movement of which I am a part, we genuinely believed, we had convinced the electorate, the voters, that all that the incumbent government was saying is bunk, it's rubbish. We are being brainwashed and the, the polls were with us all the way. We were convinced we were going to have a labor government. 
people voted away from both parties, and unfortunately, they didn't. They voted less for Labour, but slightly more for the Conservatives, and the Conservatives are in power because of the die-hard element. They're still alive, and I dare say a lot of them have been bought because they bought shares in those very companies that are in the way now. It's going to take some time. It's not going to be as easy as was envisaged. So I'm not saying it can't be done, but the time span has increased and the arguments remain the same. The dialogue will change ever so slightly over time as people begin to realize that they have been duped one more time. It's kind of like the old idiom. This is my last item on this particular speaking slot. Is that those who cause the problem are given are being given the reins to put the problem right. Because those who want the problem solved, they want to solve in that particular way so that they are still on top. I'm complete. The United States is not the whole world. A lot of governments are changing and Labor is getting in power in some places. It's, the fact is that freedom, if you want freedom, it comes like two peas in a pod with responsibility. Responsibility to urge your neighbour to register and vote. That's how democracy... Any of, or any of that, Alex, I agree with you totally. 100%. But the core of the problem still stands. Sam had his hand up as well. <clears throat> well, one of the things that always strikes me is there are many groups that claim, and I think GCC is one of them, that we need to think more systemically. And one of the systems we most actually least understand, one of the systems we understand least well is how people derive action from information. To me, it's actually a rare individual who can actually take information and alter their action, alter their life based on that information. You think it's easy, you think it's obvious, but if that were true, we'd all be rich, beautiful, and smart, you know? So information doesn't actually make much difference in the way people behave. By the way, that's uh, I acknowledge my friend Kimberly for teaching me that. So what is it other than information? We think that all this dialogue gets us someplace. It actually doesn't. You know, and <clears throat> not not grasping that, not you know, understanding how humans behave, how they feel safe, how they run their lives, where they feel comfortable, where they feel discomfort. If we don't understand that, then we don't understand the bigger systemic views. And trying to affect change without understanding that is going to be very frustrating. I think that's so one of the areas we do need to lean in over. So we Stacey need to out. understand. No, I agree with you, but it, it's just like you said, information doesn't always change behavior. I think we do understand what makes people feel safe and all those other things, but we don't do anything to change our behavior to make that happen. Is it then really understanding? Josh? Well, I, I think to, to build on that point, Sam, is the information, how the information turns into action is, is what you're talking about. That's the key. And there's a difference between knowing something and enacting something. The wisdom of knowing that this is the way it is, but then putting that into action. And I think psychologically, that comes down to prerequisites of what you were taught. Are you even able to put that? I might know how to do something, but I was taught that I'm not in power and I'm not allowed to put that into action. And, you know, there's a thing that's going on in America is uh, 
lately it's been sort of American pastime to tear people down. Anyone that's doing something wonderful, there's always a tiny, tiny, small fraction of a group that comes in and says, yeah, well, that's not me doing it. So if I can't do it, then you can't do it. And they tear that person down. What is that psychology? That's what is pre-programmed in the hierarchy of human history of just, we've got lords and kings and people in power. And if you're not one of them, if you weren't born into that, if you didn't have a family member that your parents left you a million or two billion dollars you're not in power so shut the fuck up <laughs> sorry you might be the smartest person in the world but you live in the ghetto and you have no power you have no one that's going to enact your actions you might have all the knowledge in the world but you can't do anything because the minute you try to do that someone will come over with the actual power whose parents left them the millions of dollars and they'll take you out what so that's the psychology Go ahead, yeah, what, go if we, what if we all just laughed at that immediately because it was just such a caricature of reality? Is the issue that we don't understand one another, that we don't see one another and ourselves clearly enough, we, we don't know the truth enough, so that these caricature descriptions that try to put down a person's essential character those descriptions come from people who have never even been in the same room as that person. Uh, they know nothing. They know nothing whatsoever about these people. We don't know who these people are. We don't know who ourselves even are. This is, this is quite extraordinary because these descriptions is going to, shared in social media. It's stories that try to portray a person's uh, inner evil character uh, and this is people who have never even spoken to the person it is it's just quite astonishing that this is just something we do without even well yeah i'm pretending i understand the essential character of that politician i've seen uh, is, is this or that or or that person in that country or or, or that one uh, we don't know them. Th that is the reality, and even less do we know what they could become. So what if, I mean, we know for our own life that we're changing, right? So if we're changing all the time, it means everyone's changing, so no one's a stable thing. So everyone has possibilities, everyone has potentials. So if we continue focusing on the putting people down, uh, that is just a, a, a direction that it's, it's not necessary and it's not based on reality. And yeah, before you go, yes, Winder, the, the point I want to get to here is basically uh, what if we decide consciously to totally look at this in a new way? That we just love everyone. What if we decide to do that? What would stop us from achieving it? Yes, Winder. The people who are at the apex of the system are not evil. What they believe, what they're doing and their intention is not evil as far as they're concerned. And they want their country and their fellow people to be successful. They are successful regardless of how they came by the money, be it hereditary, working hard, owning a factory or building a factory, whichever way they have something that they're not willing to share. And as far as they're concerned, that those at the bottom are ignorant, ill-educated, and there is no helping them other than not doing anything for them. Uh, there is a complete misunderstanding between those two factions, okay? I have sat with the factions at the top. Now I sit with the factions at the bottom and I listen to the conversations and I, I take particular note of the language being used and especially what is not being said openly but is nuanced and it does hurt for me to, to 
to interpret those conversations in that way. And that these, if you had for argument's sake, say a 1 billion worth of shares, not actual money, but they're worth 1 billion today. And that's your stock that you hold. And all the cash that you have is in your stocks. And you wouldn't be looking at the person who's sitting on the corner and thinking, if I, I can give him a hundred thousand pounds, dollars, whatever, and it wouldn't hurt me one little bit, but it would set that person up for life. That is not what would turn your mind. What you would be looking at is, ah, Mr. Walton, he's making four million dollars per hour, every hour, and it's increasing and he doesn't pay any tax or even a lower bit you know you, you'd be looking at somebody who's got five billion i want to be a five billion billionaire i want a yacht that's 23 feet instead of having a yacht that's 21 feet these are actual stories that are current that is a different mentality so the people at the bottom are competing in the same sort of way the one homeless guy's got a tent. The other homeless guy doesn't have a tent. And he's miserable. Okay, I can go and buy a cheap tent, you know, one of those pop-up tents. I can actually buy two for the price of one and share them out. And then somebody comes along and breaks the tent. So there is an ongoing process. And the process is obviously more people engaging with those who are destitute, but at the same time, you have the people at the top saying, stop it, we will change the laws that you can't do that. And they do, and they take well-meaning people, do-gooders who go out and feed people, they even lock them up or stop them. Take tents away from people who've been given tents so they can sleep reasonably um, dry at night. It has to, go somewhere in that the education system of the very rich, Harvard, Eton, etc., Cambridge, their, what they teach there to the ruling classes is not the stories that are being taught to the non-ruling classes. And unless we have the same playing field, same thought processes, it will not happen, all your sound. Complete. I really feel that we're in really uh, good territory here in a conversation space. However, I just wanted to uh, just note that we're three minutes above the top of the hour. Normally, we go for a couple of hours. Um, I've neglected my puppies a little bit too long already. I'm more than willing to leave this session open if you guys want to continue or invite a round of checkouts for people who want to check out. I will go deal with my puppies and I may be back if you guys are still going on, but uh, just wanted to let you know from a sense of time. Okay. Well, thanks, Sam. I'm going to have to check out myself. So um, good to meet, good to meet you guys. Um, and Josh, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, yeah, thanks for joining us, Chris. Okay. Thank you. Keep us posted. And if you have a link to a, a blog or a Twitter or something that's the ongoing saga of Sark Electricity, or if we just go to sarkelectricity.com, please post it in the uh, little chat before you go. Yeah, I'll send, great. You some, I'll send you some links, guys. Okay. Great good to, to meet, meet you, Chris. All. Great to meet you. Good to see you. Have a good Thank day. You. I think I'll just do a little check out. Uh, Unless, yeah, um, yeah, because I have to, uh, it's a little social time here as well, planned, so, but yeah, today has been, as usual, um, very rich conversation, many different places uh, touched, and obviously all kinds of questions are hanging in the air. Um, what uh, struck me was, um, when Chris shared the story about the people in the island, I was thinking about what could that island 
potentially become in let's say the best possible future of 600 people living together uh, in this area that was one question that came to me and then uh, the other issue was what he mentioned about that there was uh, this trust and misunderstandings between factions and that made me wonder what is it that we do when we make it work like is there a collection of let's say the finest moments that the people have had together because that's what it seems to all come down to it has to do with behavior it has to do with interactions psychology uh, the whole movement pattern and so if let's say we as humans have a long history and uh, we've tried many kinds of arrangements we've tried many kinds of conversations and meetings and games and um, encounters of all versions so it's this large history right behind us and also we've tried many kinds of micro societies big and large uh, then the question I would ask is what have been the moments when for whatever reason we just make it work for a certain period of time what has let's say been a really very good day so has there been a day when it just really worked with a group of people they had a great time it, it was amazing all of a sudden and what were what happened then what were the conditions and to to try to understand that because uh, because that might be you know one way we could gather knowledge that could be relevant to address all the questions that we raised and and then the question i had wondered before i came here was and i was planning to ask it so i will just ask it sort of at the end is uh, yusuf harari which joshua also was very inspired by he made the case that in regards to the future of artificial intelligence uh, population increasing um, technological development we don't have the philosophical tools perhaps to to really make us come through it in a good way okay so let's say that's true then that the challenge is we don't have the philosophical tools to deal with this new globalized reality and this complexity okay so if we accept that my question is who are creating this new philosophy today uh, which groups are actually redesigning the operating system of human thought right down to the thought structures that the basic way of um, seeing reality the ontology the epistemology uh, are there any groups today who are consciously trying to develop a philosophy that can work and work really well so that we can all eventually get a global paradise like situation which of course is is the best future that i'm hoping for so that's the question i'll just sort of throw out there at the end here but thanks very inspiring conversation as always thank you glenn well i'll, I'll do a quick check out um unless anyone wants to talk further i'm uh it's a Saturday for me. So uh, we were talking the other day about love. And I th think what came up in the conversation, which I thought was quite brilliant is changing, at least for me, this is the way I interpreted it was changing the word love to the word bonding. And I was thinking a lot about how I'm bonding with my mom's dog lately. She's been getting ticks on her fur. So I had to give her a flea bath and really, you know, 
with hot water and the cold and just rub her down and try to get the ticks off of her. And by doing that, there's a new level of bonding that's happened between me and the dog because she feels that I'm really there to help her. So she keeps coming over to me like, hey, come help get the ticks off of me. And I'm picking them off of her and we're bonding more. So I don't know if that's another word for love, but I think in society with each person, each human being, if we can bond with them by spending time and listening to their perception of reality and how they're going through their life, learning from them what helps them to be a better person, to grow, to enhance their life, that time spent, I think, is the love that you're talking about, Glenn, is if we can love each other by spending time with each other and to define love just by the bonding and how that happens is different for every soul or for every human to dog interaction, etc. Yeah. And, and how respect we everyone, with everyone respected for who they are because they're living beings. We're complex, incredibly amazing living beings. Those categories are bullshit. Come on, guys. We all know this. We are self recreating worlds of life that are conscious of ourselves. I mean, we can do this if we just come together and bond. And, uh, you know, you, that's you care, a different mind. Care for the root, Glenn. And yes, give it to us. Care for the root on that one. And then, after God created the animals, on the earth, he created man. And that, in the Christian, the whole of Christendom, which includes the Catholics, is taken to mean that man is a separate entity to all the other creatures on earth. So the words that you apply to that kingdom, the animal kingdom, are not the words that you apply to the man's kingdom. Moreover, after man was created, woman was created again, separately. And dominion was given to man, not man and woman. So these, these nuances, although we tend to think, no, well, we've grown out of that, we know, they creep up in everyday language, not by reference to them, but by deference and not mentioning them and nuancing conversations in such a way and that they still stand. So, moreover, when Christians wanted to have dominion over fellow man, they made the fellow man a beast. And it became a beast of burden. That still stands today. Unless that conversation is had out in the open, it ain't gonna happen. But there are conversations waiting to happen. And I'll go back to what I iterated before. It will happen slowly, proddingly, changing it a little at a time. A direct attack will build a wall, which is what's happening, I'm complete. I just wanna say the bonding, the love and the bonding go together. And the dog was, responding to the attention and the Doug, Doug Breitbart talked about that with the Values Foundation, time and attention is what we bring, time and attention is what we value and what we offer and what we share with each other. This is creating a bonding, is it not? Is it a virtual bonding? I mean, you know, if we met to break bread together, would we feel as if we knew each other deeper than we really do? Without the Christianity and the evolution, I mean, Charles Darwin would argue about that God creating man. He'd say man created God in his own image. Anyway, that's a different conversation. I don't like to get into politics or religion when I'm trying to find a solution for barn raising. That's the way we. That's where we reach. That's where we get to. Sometimes, love and bonding are simple things to understand, and it doesn't need to get complex. Too complex for that. We've got the butterfly effect to consider. So thank you, Josh. Over. Hopefully, I could check out before my battery completely dies. 
But um, what I wanted to say is that I think that we have a lot of miserable people in the world and we're miserable because we're not being true to who we are. We're making sacrifices to fit in with the world, to achieve what the world and partly ourselves believe is success. And I think that when we're miserable, we act miserably to others. So I see a lot of people who have worked really, really hard to achieve a level of success and they wind up begrudging others who they see as not having worked as hard as they have, or they're, they're comparing where other people are, not recognizing that we each have very different, unique circumstances. So again, I go back to the whole thing is, first we have to know who we are, what is still causing us pain, because hurt people hurt people. And, uh, I think I got everything. Oh, as far as the bonding, which time is really, I mean, the best thing you can give is your presence. However, if for whatever reason you're resenting doing that, it's okay to let somebody else do that for you. I, it, it's not for me to touch every single person in the world. So if I look at what's in front of me and I really tune in a little bit more, the people that need to meet and connect they will do that. So again, this is a bigger topic and you know, I wanted Sam to be here to touch on the whole anger thing and getting through it, but it always comes back to the same thing. We have to know who each of us are individually first. And I don't think any of us know 100, I know I don't know 100%, I'm constantly learning, but I'm motivated to keep looking and I keep myself with people that will help me to see that. And that does not happen a lot because it's a scary thing. And it doesn't feel good when you're feeling the judgment of everybody around you. And with that, I'm complete. There's a very good point Alex just raised there, which had escaped my mind for a considerable number of years. And a long time ago, when I was a youngster, there were five or six topics or subjects which were taboo, sex, football, or sports in general, politics, religion, and there was one other, at least one other, that we tended, or we were told by our elders, don't discuss these things, and don't tell them who you vote for, etc. And of late, I haven't heard that, but Alex just brought it back to mind by saying he doesn't like talking about religion and then he made a reference to God and Darwin and that man created dog a uh, man created God so <laughs> this is not the first time I've said this but there are people who make these statements but they don't want to talk about them and that the statement that they're holding is the one that they're going to keep holding because they don't want anybody to talk about it with them to try and even change it. That is cast in stone. I don't believe in God. Man made God. You can't change my mind. Don't even try it. And that is the brick walls that we hit out there. When go, especially me, because there is no subject that's taboo to me. If it's not out on the table to be discussed, you shouldn't be here. If you hold something that dear, that you should be open to discussion and put your points forward as to why you believe that to be true for you and for probably millions of others. So unless that, it's, like, you know, it's a repeat and repeat and repeat. Unless we have these conversations, we're not going to move forward. So are we going to then suggest that, well, well let's, talk about what we're going to talk about first, so we don't upset people. Is that what we're going to boil down to? We what's talk on about the table, it. what's not on the table? I'm complete. All yours, uh, Alex. You can talk about God without bringing religion into it, because it's, if God's going to talk to you, it's a personal conversation between you and God. How is a man? How is a man or a woman going to come and talk to us about God? Over. 
Uh, I'm just saying goodbye. Thank you guys, everyone. Thank you. Good to Have see you, Josh. Day. Good to see you. Very good having you, Josh. Bye. I think I'll also be going, but I also wanted to share a quote there. I really love I think it's attributed to Meister Eckhart. And it is, a god of which I could have any idea would not be worthy having as a god. And uh, of course... Can you, the call, can you say that again slowly and a little bit louder, please? Yes. A god of which I could have any idea would not be worthy having as a god. Ah, yes. We must have if, a conversation over this, a long one. Yes. If I could have an idea about what this being is, then it would not be god. So the if idea, it is a, Yeah. The, the idea you have of god depended on the conversation you have with god. Over. Yeah, that that is something in itself, of course. If one has a contact, yeah. I just want I just want to say that I agree that no topic should be off limits. That being said, I also think there are certain agreements that we don't need to make in order to still be able to move forward. Um, and I think that's where we get stuck. You know, like let's just get to yes, we have to feed the hungry. We don't have to, exactly. you know. <laughs> stand our ground about why we need to do this. Well, I, I'm in a bit of a quandary here because I'm quite religious and I'm also highly spiritual. And most people, most Sikhs that I've come across, no Sikh that I came across up until about 2010, 2011, ever said to me, there is no God. And this was a, a, a fairly well-educated Sikh in his 70s at that time, uh, mid-70s. And in one heated exchange, he blurted out, there is no God. Have you gone? No, you're still here. That's good. So, it kind of hit me for six that I took it for granted that he and I we disagreed on a lot of things and that that there was an assumption that we both would agree that there is a God an undefinable God but there is a God and since okay. then I've made it sort of a, a prerequisite that when I go into conversations that we have these hard facts up front and not be surprised later. As in the case of Alex, he mentions the divine light quite a number of times. And he's open to talk about spirituality, but not God. Well, if the spirit isn't God, then what the heck is God? And if that's not your starting point, well, pray tell, what is your starting point? Because it's the spirit that makes everything. And it's the spirit that's inside everything. And it's the spirit that's outside everything. So it's here, there, and everywhere at the same time. It's the only thing that fits the description. As to have a mode of life on how to exist with your fellow being, that's what religion is. And part of religion's responsibility to take the person to that divine light, the spirit. Whether they actually do it or not, whether the individual true, reaches yeah. that destination or not, is debatable. That's, that's real religion. That's real right. religion. So religion, and if 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 you if I'm if you're totally honest and you look at the big six. They all have ever so slightly different operating systems, and yet they have nearly 90 odd percent, 95, above 95 percent similarity. The prayer systems are very, they are the same. How do you pray? There are no other ways of praying. When do you pray? Where do you pray? There are no differences there, apart from languages. 
but the intention and the meaning is the same to gain a conducive way of living with your fellow beings and meet God while you're still alive. And those yeah. religions who block that, deny that, or for some reason don't reach there, they're failing. That's why people move away from them, all yours are. This, this part of the knowing of the connection with your Supreme Master, your God or your life or your divine life, is the thing that happens eternally, internally, personal. It doesn't come to you by praying for it. It's an inward process. It doesn't come from outside. The prayer, prayer might be internal, but this divine life comes in through language, language and understanding, compassionate language and understanding, in within your own mind. It's a thought okay. experiment. Okay. There are only three ways that a spiritual being comes about. People like Jesus, they were born that way. Those are extremely rare where a person is born with the divine light already shining for them. Second way is that these very fortunate beings are then kind enough to take disciples, trainees, and train them to not only see their own divine light, but to be able to show it just like they did. The third way is the, the epiphany. And that is somebody who may or may not be religious, may be an atheist, but somewhere along the line acquires that knowledge. And that is a life changing moment. Those are the only three ways that I know. Of. And those three ways, I'm not the only one who's saying that, they have been written down. So people can I, use those methods. Sorry, sorry, Glenn, all yours. Yes, I'm just, the, with what you're saying, I want to have a clarifying question. Question, are, are you kind of saying that religion is a form of people uh, organizing their life, their activities, their words, their actions, um, their rituals, and it's done in such a way as to connect us with what you call the divine life, which is a reality. There, there is something that uh, is referred to as, uh, with that, and that religion, therefore, and you seem to be speaking about real religion uh, as when it works, uh, which is not what people generally speak about in the press. Uh, for some reason that's never mentioned uh, but when it works it's a way for people to gather together to pray together to contemplate together to share together and also to sing and to celebrate and also to sometimes uh, perhaps cry and share difficult things and it can be many many things that can happen but it then seems that uh, that social arrangement of it is what the word religion sort of refers to a whole spectrum of variations of those, right? And so what Jess is pointing towards here, I think, is the really successful spiritual communities who have really managed to bring people to the divine light and to an understanding and a being that they have brought on them treasures that have you know gone from generation to generation and those treasures are mixed with other treasures and they're getting influences from other points so it's also a cultural evolution happening and this becomes intertwined with that so that's also i really love that perspective on religion that it's actually a way for transformation it's a way for us humans to be in contact with the truth of who we are yeah well, the, the Alex. Truth. The truth, the truth is religion evolved, just like philosophy and, and science. If you go right back before when language was just developing, like when we were still living in the Stone Age, living in caves, children still, <coughs> children still ask questions. 
and heaven and hell. The idea of heaven and hell was there before religions developed because children would ask what happens when you die. Children want to know what happens when you die. And the parents wanting their children to behave would tell them that when they die, that where they go depends on how they lived. If they lived well and did what their parents told them, they'd go to a lovely place. If they behaved and were violent and smashed things and broke toys and were loud when their parents wanted them to be quiet, they would go to a bad place. I have a, so I have sin, a you got sin and you, uh, love there mixed up, and that's where religion developed. Religion yes. developed, after, but religion's bad because religions have different views on these things, and they argue and fight. That causes wars, a, and we I can't afford. Yeah, but that's spirituality it doesn't. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which religion you choose if you have the inner understanding that it's not about the religion; it's about your connection with your higher power which you can call, yeah. if you want to call it. God. Fortunately, we have some references in the, in the written scriptures about this very sort of thing. Um, I totally agree with you. Religions have evolved because the understanding of man has evolved as man has evolved from the primates and up into manhood, if you like. Homo sapiens, to be more exact. One of the first questions that arises in the Christian Bible is not heaven or hell, but it's the shame of Adam and Eve coming to realize that they're naked. That's one of the starting points. Now, it, it comes to me now, bear in mind that according to the Christian literature, scriptures, Adam and Eve are not the only people on earth at that time. They are the chosen people. Other people are there as well who are not chosen. So having come to realize that they're naked, what do they do? They don't mention heaven and hell. You know, in, well, they were not, they were not naked. Well, that's so, they try to cover themselves. That's they another try to cover point. Themselves. That's another point. So, going through the Bible in timely fashion, it develops. And having read other religions, they too develop. And that raised the question in my mind why? Why does the information develop? It's not that. God doesn't develop, I think God develops as well, but it's dependent on man's understanding. There, has, there is this feedback loop of what do I know and how it's passed back and how it's looped back into the progression and the evolution of mankind as a whole and that particular religion as, a, as an entity on its own. Yes, Alex. Well, that tree of knowledge that we ate from was just one tree, right? There's lots of other trees in the Garden of Eden. So what I want to know is what did they get from eating the fruit of all those other trees? The only tree they were not allowed to eat from is the tree of knowledge. So if we didn't do that, if we, if we didn't eat that fruit, we would still be, we'd all be naked for a start right? And we wouldn't have any knowledge. So we wouldn't even be having a discussion. We'd just be all sitting around naked, murmuring, making funny noises with each other. <laughs> Over. What is your question? Well, it, I think it had to do with knowledge. No, no, no. Let him, let him clarify his question. Thank you. I'm making, a, I'm making an observation, really, that they have the tree of knowledge. Not a question. So was this a... All those other trees, the only tree, there's only one tree we weren't allowed to eat from. But I'm saying with all those other trees we were allowed to eat from, what did we get from those trees? Did we get any... We certainly didn't get any knowledge because they weren't the trees of knowledge. So all those other trees gave us was fruit. 
Okay, well, that's good enough for me. So if you guys will uh, excuse me, I'm uh, I'm going to put it so, so that means we'd all be sitting around naked. Yeah. Because we didn't eat from the tree of knowledge. Yeah. And God didn't God didn't want us to eat from the tree of knowledge. Right? He made that a sin. And now that he now that we did, he's gonna punish us. Right? He's gonna punish us for eternity and burn us all in hell. <laughs> Isn't that great? Isn't that religion? I think that's in their book. I think you're going off on a big tangent, which is a whole big thing to discuss. There are lots of things. Uh, hell, it doesn't, hell comes along quite a way bit down the line. And that's worth discussing if you want to discuss it that way. Uh, there are other answers to that quandary as well. And there are religions that don't have hell. And these are obviously the variations that we need to talk about. The Baha'i. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that. It's been nice chatting with you and... Um, and, um, and um, All right, take care. See you, see you Sunday. Yeah, bye. Sorry, I fell out. They were so interesting, but uh, yes, just yeah. winter has. Just, to... I'm saving the chat. I'm just signing out. Okay, okay. Well, it was really interesting. I have some inter internet issues, but uh, yeah, good to see you. And uh, yeah, so so much interest and stuff coming up today. So re really rich. Yeah. We can, we, bye -bye. We can bring some of it up on um, unblocking. Yeah, yeah, perhaps maybe I'll, uh, I, I'm not sure what happens tomorrow. Anyway. That's, yeah, no one would like those women to do their own session to talk about the men issue. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, we'll see what happens. Anyway, have a good, good day there, Alex. Bye-bye.